Okay, uh, so we're gonna get started here. Um, so um, I have a couple points that I want to introduce today. And uh, depending on how long it takes us to traverse us, um, we may go on to uh, some initial discussion of networks. Uh, but there are a couple of points that um, at some level build on what we were discussing last time. So what did we discuss last time? It did involve Ethernet models. That, that, I mean, that's the easy answer. That's the story. Yeah, so uh, Ethernet models were a big component of it, but they were contrasted with something else, Daniel. Uh, heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Justin? Yeah, so it was um, viewing the trade offs of trying to represent heterogeneity between the stock and flow model versus the Asian base. That's right. That's right. So we were talking about when you have variety headers in um, we often want to capture their model differences between people, for example, um, or, or other agents in our model. And uh, in, in, in the two major types of modeling we were contrasting there were at the one on the one hand aggregate models and stock and flow and system dynamics remember that and the other was agent based model where we have individuals represented and they had markedly different ways of representing those differences ways of representing them that had implications in some cases for the rest of the whole model so does anyone remember for aggregate models? Maybe just for concreteness, we'll you know we'll draw up our our archetypical SIR model here. And if we wanted to characterize maybe maybe the Dynamics a little bit more interesting. We'll we'll have a flow here with waning of the mean of the trend. Talk about that. Okay. Um, if if we captured something like that, and then we said, well, wait a minute, we we want to capture the fact that contact rate, one of these factors up here, the factors into force of infection and so on. That that contact rate is different for people in cities versus so urban versus rural and we wanted to to capture the fact that you know people in rural areas mix mostly with people in rural areas people in a given city mix mostly with people in that city um so but suppose we're dealing with one city and one rural area how would we capture that in an aggregate model what would we do yes uh malcolm so since our data is stored in counts, we would have to do stratification. So we can stratify more counts. That's right. Or so, separate them. Yeah. So we could have exactly. Um, we could have layers, right? So there might be susceptibles who are in a rural area versus susceptibles in an urban area. Mm -hmm. And then you could have the folks who are in an urban area. Mid Maybe we'll just say South Carolina. No. no. They meet, they mix mostly with people in Saskatoon. So the, the fraction of their contacts that are others in Saskatoon will be comparatively high, but they may have some contacts with others in rural regions, be a smaller fraction, and, and vice versa for, for rural. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, we could even subscript it by, you know, different municipalities. You could have Saskatoon and Warman and Martinsville and you know, Prince Albert up here and and Regina and, and maybe people in Saskatoon are 
comparatively more likely on a per person basis to mix with someone from Martinsville or Warman than with someone from, you know, that they might see from from Esteban or Mercer or what have you, um, further away. So um, we could capture it, but we do it through stratification. And the stratification, is it just for susceptibles? No, it's a global thing, right? We we have to do the bookkeeping, kind of keep track of it across the entire model, right? So the fact that we want to we want to capture at some level these sort of geographical units that impacts our entire model. All the all the stocks here, all the flows between them, right? And we might have, as was said earlier by Caden, I think last time. Um, I think it was Caden. Someone over on this side. So I think Caden or Troy. Um, uh, we might have some variables of like total up subsets of these, like total it up for all the cities of a certain size or something like that. But but by and large, kind of capture heterogeneity with respect to some characteristic means impacting across our entire model. In an agent-based model, where we have these agents, how do we capture that heterogeneity? Yeah, we have parameters. We we just store a few extra bits of information, maybe about where that agent lives, right? Um, for each for each of them, right? And so we might say, you know, um, uh, municipality or something like that, and this one will be Virginia, and this one would have the municipality of Saskatoon, and this one would have the municipality of that point or whatever, right? Um. And so, on. and so on. Um, so we tag each person with that characteristic. Uh, a few extra bits, perhaps in this case, but on a per person basis. Um, there's really no global impact on the characteristics. Maybe each of these people has a has a have state charts associated with them and et cetera. And it's not like we have to subscript those at all. No, no, just keep track of this. And maybe some of those would take into account what municipalities they were in at some level, but, but we don't have to modify all across the model in terms of structure. Do you remember that? So one of the take homes there that I most want you to know in fact, I want you to know so much, it's almost guaranteed to be on the exam. Uh, is for each of those traditions, and I do get on the one hand, uh, agent based model on the other, there are some things that it scales really well with, and there are some things that doesn't scale so well. For agent-based modeling, uh, what thing does it scale quite well with? As you add what, it doesn't grow too quickly. Yes, Ben. More characteristics, like more characteristics of people. That's right. It, it doesn't grow multiplicatively. Do you remember that idea? That if we had, you know, rural, re if we had municipalities maybe into 10 regions, and then we want to keep track of whether someone was born in Canada or not, suddenly we double, right? We go from 10 distinctions for, sub for susceptible to 20, just because we wanted to capture this extra information. So in an aggregate model, it scales poorly with keeping these distinctions, right? It's multiplicative. Each one multiplies the model number of divisions in the model accordingly. Whereas, as Bab said, at an individual level, we just tag a bit of extra information on. Maybe we add, you know, we grow it by 10% or something, but we don't like double it, right? We could add one extra bit to be track were they born in Canada or not per person, right? One extra bit. Were they born in Canada or not? Um, it, it's It's quite frugal actually in terms of the amount of information but there's something that 
that stock flow modeling, this sort, scales really well with. In fact, it doesn't change it at all. Whereas it's quite expensive for HMAS model as we grow the what? Yes. Population. population size, right? How does that impact? If I if I changed it from 10,000 people to a million people in my model, right? Increased by a factor of 100. How would it affect the running time of an SIR model? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't at all, right? It's running with bigger numbers in it. <laughs> the differential equation is like the SDT, the IDT. Okay, they're 100 times larger, but it, it doesn't affect its runtime at all. Does the space go up? Does it occupy a lot more space? No, not at all. Fraser may small one, does it matter? Oh, darn right about it. And generally speaking, if, you, if you're dealing with it in a naive way, um, in most implementations are naive, including any logics in this regard, if I multiply the population size by 100, the running time will go up by at least a factor of 100. No, I say at least. Why, why do I have that sort of that is a lower bound if for a nine from communication. Why why is that? How can it be more than that that it goes up? The runtime increases by more than a hundred, let's say. If I but if I increase the population size by hundred, maybe it runs it, you know, it's, it requires more than a hundred times as long as the run. Why could that be, Malcolm? It may be determined by the connectivity between agents. So if yeah. you're fully connected, then you're increasing it by you got it. If each person is connected with every other agent, right? Then the number of connections um, is gonna it, it, it's going it's gonna be proportional to the population squared, right? Uh squared. Squared. Each if each person, so n people, each of whom is connected to n minus one people, right? n times n minus one. And if you consider them to be undirected, like a connected to b means b connected to a, then we might say divided by two for the, the total number. Because if, I, if I'm connected to person b, you know, um, we don't double count that as you know, two connections there, um, just, just one just viewed as uh, Right. So, so you might have uh, n times n minus one divided by two, or if it's one, you know, a certain direction. Who is, you know, it is directional. Then n times n minus one, but but it's it's at least quadratic, right? Quadratic. Yeah. Um, it goes up with that squared. Hmm. The population size. So maybe we increase the population size by hundred, and the number of network connections. Now um is is going up by a factor of ten thousand. Um because we have a hundred times more people, each of whom is connected with a hundred times as many people, roughly. So network connections are a big reason. There's, there's another reason for those computer scientists in the room. Those who have taken operating systems courses or concerned with what are in computer science commonly called computer systems issues. Why might it be if I run a model that requires a hundred times as many agents and therefore a hundred times at least as much memory? Is it possible at some point to almost hit a wall in performance? Yes, Troy. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be paging to disk. It's going to be thrashing. And then it, it'll get even worse if your scheduler realizes that you're thrashing, so it'll schedule with you less. And then exactly. other things are ending, and it's going to burst. Yeah, it, 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 it's going to be at some point, you may hit a wall in terms of performance, right? And you have to start really 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 working in terms of swapping memory in and out 
to do the basic operations you need to do, right? For, for those interested in um, software engineering or interested in system, computer systems issues, there's actually a lot there. Like once you go from small, very small contained models to models in the millions or more of agents, and you want them to run performantly. There's a really a, a lot of interesting computer science that can come in to nail that, and and it can make a huge difference. I'll just throw out you know comments to the sort of thing my lab has worked on or or others, but um, large scale parallelization, dividing up. Hey, if you have localized networks, right? If I'm connected with people nearby me, and they're connected with people nearby them, maybe I can carve out the network into a set of low cut areas in the sense of, you know, I, I grab a bunch of people, maybe it's people in a city, um, and I, I have them on, on local, on a certain local machine, um, and another city might be on another machine, you could take into account distributed processing, right? Um, between machines. You could make use of multiple cores, right? If you have 40 cores, you could have them work on different areas of the system, but you can carve, carve up regions of space that are because the connections are localized and then take the hit when there has to be communication between those areas. Mm -hmm. um, you can make use of parallel computation technology potentially at a lower level for certain types of models. You know, things like GPUs, FPGAs. You might compile your model into an FPGA that a field programmable gate array that it takes advantage of a large amount of parallelization in terms of the agent's running time. You might be able to make use of very efficient ways of, of representing the memory involved to reduce the, the memory footprint. And there's um, many, many further areas where you can achieve economies uh, with agent-based models that really make a difference. But one thing that's clear, stock, aggregate stock flow models scale poorly with heterogeneity, but really well with population size. Agent-based models scale poorly with, with um, population size but quite well, very well, with heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Remember, we also said we can represent continuous heterogeneity, right? Each person could have could have an income um, or a geographic location that's a continuous quantity. You have relational people that kind of reference to others in ways you really count within SIR model. Are, are, are these things making sense to you? Um, there's lots of other you know, things I could I could say about the kind of the engineering of these. I, I will say that there's interesting science as well about the science of scaling. And if anyone in here is interested in physics, for example, um, one thing you may know about the last century of physics is, you know, there's been a lot of interest in kind of physical scaling relationships and, and physical systems about as you double the size, how does certain aspects of behavior change? And I will say with um, with Asian-based models, taking advantage of dimensional structure, you can figure out ways that instead of simulating model with a population of size 10 million, you can get results much more frugally by simulating it with maybe 100,000, and then reasoning about how the behavior observed scales up. And it isn't linear. It may scale up with the square of the population size, et cetera. And this gets into issues of like dimensionless quantities, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting science in engineering, software engineering, systems engineering. But I want to build on some of these topics we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I'm I'm gonna show some slides. 
So I talked about heterogeneity. And the focus last time was on static characteristics of people. So it might be whether they're born in Canada or not, or their current income, or their viewed as, you know, um, a fixed quantity, um, or someone's self identified gender, or what have you. Um, but things we treat in the model right now is as more or less constant for the for the time frames of the model. Um, but we did notice, we did emphasize last time that if a lot of these scaling phenomena come from an aggregate modeling. The organization is by say we group things that have the same characteristic, right? Mm -hmm. We put things in the same bin. And some of those aspects are actually dynamic, right? Like someone's status with respect to COVID-19 or something like that. We we might put them in this stock if they're susceptible, this stock they're affected, and people flow between these over time, right? We go with that idea? Well, this time we're going to be talking about taking those ideas and talking about it in terms of heterogeneity, in terms of progression. So we have aggregate models and we have uh, individual based models. Uh, and at first glance, so when you see a state chart and you've been looking at stock and flow models before them, they look pretty similar, right? Looks like almost just different labeling, susceptible stock, susceptible state. Infected or exposed st uh, stock, exposed state. The transition from susceptible to exposed stocks to flow sort of maps to an exposure transition, right? In the state chart. I think hopefully you, you see the connection, right? Um, it's just a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? What What's a difference between, if I showed these to you on the final exam and I said, explain one sense in which these are similar, you might just say what I did with the one point correspondence between thoughts and states and flows and transitions. What's one way in which they differ? The state charts were individual. Individual. And the flow is the stock is a maximum of That's right. some community. That's right. Exactly. Insightful. And we're going to see that that has big consequences. Now, I'm going to come back to a further point, but I want to I want to build on Uche's in, insights there, okay? Um, because we're going to come back and emphasize the different components. So here in a state chart, at any one time for this state chart. What's in those states? And it, it, so, so UJ sort of let us through. What's in this? Is it a count? No, it's uh, you think individual. Yeah. So at, at one at any one time, the person is in one of these states. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, we'll I'll talk later, likely about a hierarchical states and so on, but. For these simple states, they're either in this or this or this or this. Mm -hmm. To put it in the language of math, they're collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. You're you're in one of these states with respect to your infection status, and you're in exactly one. Mm -hmm. And being in one means you're not in another. Mm -hmm. Are you good with that idea? Yes. Correct. Yes. And we're going to come to this in just a minute because it's at the heart of some of the scaling issues we'll be dealing with. So only one state within a state chart is active right now. As it turns out, and this will be really important for the 
when I come back to the discussion of transitions, we can keep track of how long an individual has been in that state. Can we do that in stock flow? Keep track of how long a particular person has been in stock? No, just a count, right? If we look at that count now and it's 100 people that are in infective now, and I run it forward by a year, and I look at it again, and it's 105. Are those 105 or are, are there 100 of them that have been there the entire time? Or are they a different 105, you know, different 105 people entirely? We can't in general, in general say for that. There are cases where we can trace back logic and say, well, you know, um, uh, it, it very few of them are there based on the particulars of the structure. But in general, those counts don't give us that information. They give us a cross section. Right now, how many are here? They don't allow us to trace the history of people. You get that far. In an age based model, we can trace people's history. Hmm? A person that was in this state, how long did it take for them to get a to get infected? How long were they in that state before they became infectious? How many times have they been infected overall? We can readily keep track of that in the ancient base model. We can keep track of their history. You get that point. That's an important difference. We can't do that here in general. We can't tag people and keep track. Um but it's really this last point that I want to talk about, if we have multiple processes. So I'm going to draw up a stock flow model. And I'm going to have one that's coping, that's along the top, and one that's influenza. I'm going to say, I'm going to simulate COVID influenza because I want to capture the fact that um, if someone is sick with COVID right now, they're more likely because their immune system is really struggling and so on, and they're coughing and wheezing and, and they have a lot of respiratory problems, they're more likely to get influenza right now. Or maybe I want to keep track of the fact that sometimes people get them together at the same time. Okay, these are true things. And in fact, Having COVID right now makes your influenza case worse. It makes it more likely you'll end up with what's pneumonia, which is fluid in your in your lung. And if you don't think it's an issue for your new young people, I had a student this last year who, who was in the hospital for pneumonia. Um uh very, very serious. Uh so suppose we want to capture that, the, the interaction between the two. Can I just draw out the stock flow for this, stock flow for that? And I'm off to the races in terms of characterizing, you know, this, this fact that if I have one, then I can get the other more easily and I can get sicker with the other. Does that work? Yeah. No, because um, you have no way to like show if, let's say, a person's had like susceptible to COVID, how do you know which state they're in? Like, Precisely. Like, you, you hit it exactly. It's just numbers. It's just numbers. We have a count of people who might be infected with COVID right now to count there. But of that count, how many are in the exposed state for flu or the susceptible state for flu or how many of those are recovered? We, we can't really get an answer to that question for them because it's not the same people. It's just some anonymous count. You get that point. So could this still be useful, yeah, in terms of knowing over time how does COVID spread independently of flu in the same population. But what it's not going to give you is a picture of how for a given person the risk of getting influenza is worse when they have infected, because we can't make for that person, you know, their risk higher of, of getting infected by flu. We, we can't track that particular person. Right um, uh, within this model, you just know the count of people who are here, the count of people in each of these stocks. Do you get that point? Mm -hmm. um, we're not capturing combinations. So how would we do that? How how could we capture the fact that 
when I'm sick with COVID, I'm more likely to get influenza or I'm all clear in influenza more slowly. How would I, how would I, how would I capture that? If I really wanted to do that, what would I do? What you did behind you basically, you have to map every combination. I have to map every combination. The horror starts to think yeah. in. You, you get the same pattern, I hope, as for heterogeneity. You have to consider with stock aggregate models, you have to consider, as Ken noted, the combination, right? We saw this with static characteristics, right? Income, age, whether someone was born in Canada. You have to consider those who were born in Canada and low income and and you know of the youngest age group and those born in Canada, low income of the medium age group and low income born in Canada of the older age group and medium income born or what have you and, and consider all possible combinations. Here you have to consider all possible combinations. So here might be COVID and long the horizontal direction and along the vertical direction might be flipped. Now here, how would we, so if, if we had this and we bit the bullet and, and put this in place, how would we keep track? Or how could we make all your infective with flu, or sorry, with COVID, you're more likely to get infected by flu. And so when you're with and you're infected by COVID, you're more likely to get infected by flu. How would we, how could we represent that? Where would we go in the model? Where in the model will be affected by that? Yes. So uh, Francisco. Yeah. What if we have other variables like uh, okay. in the, mm -hmm. in the outflow? Uh -huh. That's not... Good, good. Yeah. So you could, or you could have a higher, Beta value, Prince. Remember, remember, beta is a chance for contact between an infective and a susceptible that someone will be infected by it. So for so I'll be um mm -hmm. um. So you could have a higher beta value here. Meaning if you're here, your chance per contact that the effective with COVID has with someone with influenza, they're more likely to be transmitted to them. If we want to capture the fact that they would stay infected with that influenza, if they were infected, they'd stay infected longer, where might that affect it? Down here, right? Because this is infected with COVID, susceptible to influenza. Um, that's that slash. The next one down. For those online, I'll, I'll try to do it here. This was infected by COVID and what for influenza? Exposed for influenza. And infected by COVID and what for influenza? Infected, yeah, and recovered. So if we wanted someone who's infected by COVID right now to have slower clearance of influenza if they're infected by influenza as well, we might meet, have a longer mean time to go from this stock down to this one. Do you get that point? But so, so could we capture it in this way? Yes. But with, ladies and gentlemen, the curse of dimensionality. Do you see the curse? Yeah, for those wondering, I'm not referring to myself, I'm referring to the, the board. <laughs> right. Um, uh, this is the curse of dimensionality. So the SHA, so my students are working for the SHA, Sir Kruger, my former not long graduated um, uh, doctoral student in charge of that team, and they were working on modeling 
COVID-19 and influenza and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, um, which hits elderly and babies really badly. So suppose they were to come to us and say, they'd be using an age based model for good reason here. If, if, if they were, if we were to, instead of a soft flow model, if that's what we had built, and they said, now I want you to have three states for RSV for this other virus, how would that affect things? Another dimension, third dimension, right? Would we'll multiply the model by a factor of three. Every one of these, right? Would need to be replicated for every combination of that natural infection of RSV. Susceptible to RSV, infected for RSV, recovered for RSV. Do you understand that point? It's hideous. It's hideous. And at a certain point, I'll be with you in a moment, Jeff. At a certain point, and it happens pretty early. <laughs> your ability to focus on the model gets overwhelmed by just the detail complications. There's too much going on. It's too busy, right? Um, there's too many things for you to really see the forest. You can't see the forest for the trees, as we say, right? Um, there's too many things going on and all these different flows that you, it's hard for you to kind of summarize things. And you've got all these duplications of code that are very, very similar, um, differ just in their details, just to capture this. It's a giant bookkeeping headache. Jeff? I was going to say, I think it would also be increased difficulty in finding like good estimates for the transition rates between all the extra dimensions. Because that's, that's right, if you wanted to tailor them. And um, even without tailoring them, you might, you, you know something about how many people at any one time are in each. But you'd want to take advantage of this if you could by tailoring those rates. So that's right. And and um, there's a lot of data by which this could be tailored, but you might not have access to them. And this holds for, for many types of combinations. So I want you to tell me, really me this now, for an agent-based model, an individual-based model, where instead of, of stock flows, we have these things that at a certain level look similar to them. How would this be different? So suppose I wanted at an individual level, not with a stock and flow, but with one of these here state charts, I wanted to capture COVID and influenza. What would I have within the person? What, what would that look like? Yeah. You have two state charts, one for COVID and one for influenza. Great. Excellent. Two state charts. Why is it that I don't have to have all combinations of them? That I don't have to have a state for susceptible COVID, susceptible influenza, you know, one state that's like pair of status with the vector, susceptible COVID, susceptible influenza, susceptible COVID, exposed influenza, susceptible COVID, infected. Why is it I don't have to do that? Yes, Malcolm. Because uh, it's basically represented implicitly by yeah. where they find themselves. Exactly. Exactly. Remember, they're in exactly one state. Someone said it earlier. And I'm trying to remember who it was. It may have been Troy or somewhere over here. For each of the state charts, you're in exactly, or maybe it was Malcolm. Maybe it was you. No, I think it was. Okay. Okay. Um, for each of these state charts, you're in exactly one state at a given time. But if I had, so if this were COVID-19 state chart and I had an influenza state chart, Am I, am I in one state between the two of them, or is it one state for each? Each state has its own. Each has its own state. And as Malcolm said, this it's kind of almost implicit in the sense we almost don't notice it, but I would have a COVID status, and then I'd have an influenza status, right? Keep track. Do I have to keep track of all combinations, all 16 combinations like this? No, there's no, there's no curse of dimensionality here either. How many states would there be in total between those two state charts? Eight, not 16. 
16 will be if I had all combinations, but it'll be eight. It's more akin to this if this is the first state chart and this is the second, right? But I'm actually keeping track of who's in, for each person, they're, they conceptually, their state is a pair, right? Of their COVID status and their influences. Do you get that point? So suppose I did that. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to have the person's progression for influenza. Their chance of getting infected, given exposure to influenza, their chance of actually getting infected to be higher if they're currently infectious with COVID. How would that, could I do that? Could I do that? Yeah. I could, I could know for this person. Contact, maybe there's an effective message, effect, you know, exposed message being sent to them. And we could check, hey, if they're currently infected, the person receiving that, indicating they've been exposed to this bug, to influenza. If they're currently infected by COVID, we'll, we'll flip a weighted coin that makes it 75% more likely that they got infected by by influenza. Could we do that? Yeah, we have that information. Absolutely. But there's not a cursive dimensionality. It's additive in terms of the amount of information, not multiplicative. Same pattern. Do you recognize it? New Tatus and New Tatus? I mean, it's the same pattern we saw earlier when we had to keep track of their immigration status. It's additive, right? One more bit per person. We add that information in. Stock flow model, it's multiplicative. We double the population. So, oh, we double the number of stocks in the population. Do you get that point? So whether it's static characteristics, characteristics that don't change, like was someone born in Canada or not? Or whether it's something that's changing over time, like your infection status, you get the same basic trade off. On the one hand, with an aggregate model, it's multiplicative, and you get this cursive dimensionality to capture that information. And often you can't see the forest for the trees. I don't know what's going on. Here. Whereas at an individual level, you get this additive component. You add in some other and you can still get the interaction effects in a surgical sort of way. Not in this sort of brute force, the brutality of the cursive dimensionality. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm referring to the diagram, not to myself. Um, um, okay, so... This is, a, this is a big matter. At a, at a practical level, it's very important. This breeds errors. Where do you see, you can't see the forest through the trees. Where you have this abundant welter of obscuring details of distractions, you lose the ability to, to get to the essence of it, the heart of, of, of matters. You, you can't see all the details. There's just too many things to keep track of. It's really we only can specify things concisely, expressively, elegantly. That's when we can often prevent errors. Errors creep in if we can't make out all the details. It's just too much visually, and we might they might go unnoticed. So this matter... This, this difference, the additive nature of heterogeneity, dynamic heterogeneity, change over time, static heterogeneity, characteristics in a agent-based model matters in terms of reducing the risk of errors. Errors breed in messes, mm -hmm. just like cockroaches breed in, you know, in, in, in high entropy, Messy and yes, yeah. Um, so this is how like how at the end of the term we talk about like how a market learning is for the extracts and waste on detail. Yeah. Like you got to remember, I told you everything. You wouldn't even just go to that's right. 
That's right. And and a beautiful analogy. Yeah. So like this is obscuring it's it's obscuring us with irrelevant detail. Mm -hmm. For those who are in from software engineering, that one, like like that, I might notice, I might note the same issue comes up with software all the time. If if you pick the right abstractions in software. You can focus on the essential. You can you can cut through a lot of you. You don't have to see the function definitions you don't want, or you don't have to see all the details of the class structure unless you want to. You have the right level of abstraction. You can see the essential structure, and it helps you under reason through how to make a change, etc. If you have a big hairball of a code base just tons of detail you don't need to see forced upon you. Things are not carved out into good abstractions, into good functions, or even good classes, or what have you. It, it's really hard to reason about and, and, and uh, to see where to change things. Everything is tangled with everything else, and it gets in the way of, of your ability to, to reason it. If we had a map like that, that was just filled with distractions, its value to us as Babs notes would markedly decrease. So when it comes to software, finding the right abstractions is, is of key importance. Um, and those of you who might go on to 470 may, may learn about this, um, depending what rendition of it you, know, you take. You may see examples in clone detection for detecting the software clones, or you may see it in terms of getting the right functional abstractions. Or indeed, I might know, UGF, the right categorical abstraction for the ultimate reusability. Algebraic data types, lenses, monads to capture side effects prevent you from having to be distracted by detail. But that story, ladies and gentlemen, is to be told under a different mode. Okay. Um, so this is a big difference. And if you don't think this is, you know, uh, a practical matter, you're, you're unfortunately tragically wrong. Um, when you're building up real world models, like we did for all the provinces of Canada during the pandemic through Public Health Agency of Canada's contracts with us, circulated to the public health officer, Teresa Tam, as well as to the decision makers in all the provinces or for First Nations reserves. These decisions, these issues of structure were key governors of whether how nimble we could be, how quickly we could advance things, how cumbersome. And the curse of dimensionality with our soft flow models used with machine learning was a key great limiting factor. It really got in the way of progressing quickly. This very HPV model, two cervical screening groups, three sexual activity groups, two smoking statuses, two sexes. And so each visual stock here is actually 408 underlying stocks. And you get the equations for these things have the curse of dimensionality. So all these different sort of combinations of policies. And good luck spotting an error one in here. Oh, that's too much of your mind. It's, it's just, it's too much detail. It's unnecessary detail. Whether it's in software engineering more generally or modeling, these things matter. So this ability to have state charts side by side, capturing additively dynamic heterogeneity, heterogeneity over time, people progress along one thing versus another versus another, is a key asset with agent-based modeling. It's an incredibly important tool in our arsenal as you're considering interacting of, of conditions. And often we'll have you know many of the many of these sort of alongside TB, diabetes, tobacco. 
And if you're skeptical, why would you consider these together? There's excellent reasons to consider them together. Tobacco use worsens risk of tuberculosis. Diabetes worsens risk of tuberculosis. Tobacco risk uh, worsens risk of diabetes, uh, et cetera. So you, you often want to consider this. And a lot of the people who are in a difficult situation for one are in a difficult situation for, for another. Um, okay, so... So we've been talking about heterogeneity, dynamic static, but I want to come back to another key point here with state charts that is different. And I kind of glossed over it before. It has to do with these state charts um, uh, and the transitions within the state charts. Mm -hmm. So we said there's kind of often this one-to-one -one mapping between the transitions in the state chart here and the transitions in the stock flow diagram, right? This maps to this, this maps to this, this waning of immunity maps to this guy here. But it turns out there's some really big differences in terms of your flexibility here. Does anyone remember for a stock flow model from this floor, nay, from this very square meter on which I stand right now? I spoke with you about the fact that a given state in a system dynamics model has a certain characteristic. That characteristic is different for a series of states, but one state in isolation, there was a term I used, it began with M, and it ended with the word, well, the, the, the suffix, the last four digits, four, four characters were less. Does anyone remember? Single stock in system dynamics is memoryless. What do I mean by that? That like, the infectious state is memoryless in in isolation. Mm -hmm. Memoryless state. Good what previous iterations of it like? That's state, right. It treats everything as if it were new. It doesn't care what happens. exactly. It treats everything in there as well mixed. Well mixed in the sense that. It doesn't matter how long ago you came into this, your chance of leaving is the same. You cannot say, well, someone who came into this over 10 days ago now has a higher chance of leaving than someone who came in yesterday. No, it's based on this stock being well mixed. And, and it, if you go to real life system dynamics packages, there are some that try to relax that through things called conveyors or other, but traditional system dynamics it is memoryless. It doesn't, your chance of leaving is independent of when you came there. The set of people within the stock is, is uh, homogeneous from the standpoint of, of leaving. Is that true for a state term? Is that necessarily true for a state and a state term? The answer is a resounding no. And Justin, so in a state chart, we actually can very much keep track of when someone came in. We can keep track of their history in general. The number of times, I think Ken was referring to it, the number of times they, for example, they've previously been infected. We can keep track when they came into this particular state. We could have their chance of leaving for unit time to come on when they came in, how long they've been there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about this a bit and, and just reflect on it. In any logic, the way in which, one of the ways in which this shows up <laughs> is many transition types. And I'm gonna list five of them here. A timeout transition, a fixed rate, a message transition, a conditional or predicate, you might call it, an arrival transition. You leave when you arrive at a place. Of those, which is which reminds you the most of the situation for a stock flow model? 
for leaving. One of those is very much like the logic we see in stock flow, which is it? I'll go through those again. Timeout rate, uh, message received, conditional, or predicated in a, in a lot. Mm -hmm. right. It's a hazard. It's a chance per unit time of leaving. What's that? Oh, there's a typo. Okay. There's a fixed change per unit. Um, uh, some, oh, fixed. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, chance. This should be a chance. Thank you, Matthew. Chance. Okay. Chance. Probability per unit time. Yeah. Um, and even there, as, as that alluded to, um, the truth is I could make the rate variable. It can make it depend on how long they've been there, for example. Um, but if it's a fixed rate, that's very similar. If at any one time there's a rate, a chance per unit time of leaving, um, that's very similar to the situation for we have with many, you know, first order delay type structures in in stock flow in a in a, a stock flow model. So we might have a rate of. 0.01 of leaving. I'll, I'll revisit this issue. It's so important. We'll be revisiting it in December as well. If I have a chance per day, if the, if the time you know the model is days, I have a chance per day of 0.01, 1% per day. Chance of leaving. How long on average will I be in this state before I leave? Yes, baby. 100 days. 100 days. One over point of zero one. Same mathematics. It's, it's the same mathematics you saw in stock flow. Remember that? Mm. So the, the dimension of one over time, one over or a unit of one over day. Because it's like a probability, and a probability has what dimension? What's that? Yeah, not its dimension. It's a unit dimension. Write it as one, um, because it's like number of heads that you've got on a coin over the number of total flips of the coin. Coin divided by coin, you know, coin flips. Cone of coin flips divided by count of coin flips. It's it it cancels out. If you measure coin flips and millions of coin flips means one, you know, um, that's your unit of measure. If you want to, you know, that in the numerator, denominator. So it's dimensionless. Um, but the the chance per unit time of leaving probability per unit time. Yeah, here one over one over day, or dimension one over time. Are people okay with that notion? Okay, now though, I wanna talk about these others. A timeout transition. You leave after exactly some amount of time. For some of us, think of it as being a fixed amount of time right now. It's a constant, a certain value, 10, 10 days, let's say. Is that memoryless? No, it's memory it's memory full. It's not that it doesn't depend on when you got into the stock. It depends only on when you got into the stock, right? You leave exactly after 10 days after you got in. So a timeout transition is readily possible. Because in an individual level ball, we can keep track of when they came into this state, mm -hmm. or when they came into this state. This is a timeout transition, this one right here. Means the clock is ticking when you uh, for when you're gonna leave. Maybe this is 10 days, and after exactly 10 days, you'll leave. Could we do that in a stock flow model? Could we have them leave the infectious state in exactly 10 days after they came in? No, it, it has to be memory. You can't have it remember because there's no particular people here. It's just a count. 
just a stinking count of people that are in there. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's the same people now that were there before in general. It's just a count. We don't track individuals. In a state chart, we can. And we do. And we shall. And we shall gain secure great benefit. You can also have a message printed. What's a, what's a message printed? Yeah, no, it would just be a thing like, um, like you use the example of the tax cities. Like, essentially, you can send a message to yeah. two agents and say, okay, you've been exposed to the infected. That's right. Low of chance or something. That's like that. right. It's an, in general, asynchronous. It's not pre scheduled. It's based on sort of, sometimes in computer science, these are called dynamic things. Like, we determine at runtime when it's set. It's not that it's set. It, Exactly time 10 or something. Um it, it's it's asynchronous, it could be sent at any time by another agent, and it might represent spread of mouth, isn't it? Could represent spread of disinformation, conspiracy theory. It could represent um a person uh you know um engaging in behavior and the other person may engage in imitative behavior. Some person says, hey, you want to smoke? And, and offers them a cigarette, whatever. Um, some sort of interaction between them in a discrete way. A predicate transition, you only transition when a certain condition becomes true in the model. Maybe once my viral load reaches a certain level, I'll go to the hospital for care. Um, or, you know, I will pass away or what have you. Um, and finally, arrival, which is when I arrive at a certain place. I'm traveling, and, and when I get there, I'll, I'll transition out. So at a certain level, um, okay, you don't, you don't need this. Um, at a certain level, uh, you might look at these and think they're, you know, uh, very, very similar in terms of what they allow. But the picture is because of the information that's available to you at an individual level, the fact you can keep track of how long you've been in the state, you can keep track of history. You can have interconnections between different agents, between uh you know, agents that interact by sending each other messages. We have a much bigger vocabulary for this. Timeout transitions are something we, which we can't capture in a stock flow model. We can have varying hazard rates, varying chances per unit time that someone will leave based on how long they've been there or based on some characteristic of them. Maybe their their chance per unit time of clearing infection, how their chance per unit time that they will clear infection, maybe it gets smaller, so they can spend longer time there if they're infected by COVID. Maybe this is influenza, and if they're infected by COVID simultaneously, it becomes lower. So we have a much larger, much richer vocabulary with with uh, the constructs of individual level characterization mm -hmm. than we do with stock flow. And this matters, particularly for keeping track of people's history, keeping track of how long they've been in there. Um, we, we have a much smaller, more focused, more constrained vocabulary for a system my name is small. Now, I told you a given stock, I reminded you a given stock is memory. A whole collection of stocks, is that memory? No, no, most certainly. No. I mean, you could have the chance that someone will go from the Texas to recover. Um, excuse me, but someone will become the recovery is quite a bit lower if they're in the susceptible state compared to if they're in the recovery state, right? Um, 
So if you consider a set of states in a row, it, that's how you capture memory full processes, ones that are not memoryless. And so it's not that we can't capture memory full things here, it's just our vocabulary is smaller, our repertoire is much smaller. So at an individual level, we can capture this extra information uh, much more readily within a uh, within a state chart. Okay. Um, okay. So we've just been talking about some trade-offs between aggregate stock flow models on the one hand and agent-based or individual level models. We talked about static heterogeneity. We saw a curse of dimensionality. The fact that with stock flow, we have multiplicative growth in terms of size of the model and running time. In fact, as we as we consider more types of heterogeneity, considering some, whether someone is born in Canada or not, doubles the size of the model. Is it correct? In an individual based model. It's additive, right? We saw, so we have one more bit of information per person. When it comes to dynamic heterogeneity, capturing multiple progression along multiple dimensions, we go from a cursive dimensionality with stock flow model to just a set of state charts side by side, additively rising number of states. With a, with a state chart, with a, with an individual based model. But as Malcolm said, it's it's kind of, you're, there's an implicit ability to capture the state of being in one and the other and the other. You don't lose that combination. You're in fact, gain, like you, you, you can capture that combination. Well, it's not gaining, I mean, you can you preserve that by having them side by side. It's just different aspects of their state. You don't have to, consider all combinations here. And then we talked about how the vocabulary for each of these transitions is much richer for an agent-based model, for an individual-based model, because of the information to which you have access at an individual, individual level. John Pies has been working on causal loop diagram. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, so, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, with an individual based model, we have a far larger vocabulary. Um, we have a much richer repertoire uh, at our disposal. We can keep track of history, how long someone has stayed here, and use that information within their, their broader interactions. So those are some of the key messages I expect you to take away from this. Hmm? Um, now, okay, um, three monoidal constructions for um, the use of segment in cosmic. Okay. Um, now, I want to I want to transition to the next topic where I'm going to ask you to watch a video, and it's related to assignment assignment two that that you're working with now, and it has to do with this other area where we have all this added precision, all this added ability to capture a structure. It has to do with networks. Why do we care about networks? Why do we care about networks when we're dealing with complex systems? Yep. Because um, they basically capture all the relationships that might exist between yeah. what's in there. You yeah, had the exact word I was looking for. Relationships. All about relationships. And it's about relationships that are, that have some component of discreteness to them. Like, you know, the, that um, one person is connected with another person, right? Um, let's say one person is connected, you know, a veteran is connected with a service dog. Um, or uh, a person is connected with a company or what have you, right? There could be multiple types of networks for a given agent, right? 
They might have an Instagram network, right? They might have a network associated with work colleagues. Might have a network of family, right? Um, nuclear family and extended family, what have you. Um, we can capture these and we can label them. We can have different types of relationships. They may be in part of a network that's professional relations network, a medical network, where I have a cardiologist and I'm a primary care physician, I'm a hematologist or something like that. So capturing these relationships is often of keen interest. Why is it important to capture those? Why is it valuable to capture those relationships? Give me a reason that when it comes to the spread of COVID, why I might want to capture relationships. Yes, that. Excellent. That's exactly right. Exactly right. It, and, and you said it probably better than I would have been able to say it in that moment, which is it affects the phenomenon. It, it, it's a key, what we sometimes say is mediator to it. So it's a key factor that governs that. The phenomena we're interested in, the, the dynamics of it over time. And that's not just a matter of curiosity or, or scientific interest, which it is. It, it matters for intervention. I may undertake interventions that change the number, right? And we talked about that a few times ago, right? Um, we talked about, for example, social distancing. Uh -huh. Work at home orders where you change your social network. Talk about contact tracing to find who you've been in contact with to try to find people you might have infected, right? All these things are about networks. Networks affect sources of information, networks affect sources of innovation, influences, etc. So capture there's a good case to be made that it matters to capture networks to simulate the phenomenon well, but to intervene with the phenomenon. Networks are often of key, key interest. But just as our models have structure that induces dynamics, networks have structure patterns of connectivity that induce dynamics. And the nature of that structure dictates the nature or it's go helps govern the nature of the dynamics that come out of it. And it turns out that networks have not just everyone connected with everyone else in some willy-nilly sort of formless way. No, 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 no. These things have, have structure associated with them. There's, there's whole classes of networks. And I, I stood here a few times ago and I, I talked about a, a few of them. The idea of a small world network. Most of my connections are with people close to me, but some are with people much further away. Scale-free networks where no matter how many connections someone has, if we, if we consider the probability of having that many connections compared to having twice that number of connections, the ratio of those two, probability of having 10 connections versus two to 10 connections, that ratio is the same regardless of chain. And in a network like that, it may be that most people have few connections but some people have a huge number of connections. This is called, anyone know the type of network it, it, that exhibits this, this induces power law scaling? Anyone? Mm -hmm. It turns out that it's called a scale-free network. No matter how many connections you're considering, okay, 
the probability of having that many compared to 2k is the same, that ratio. And this describes from structures of, of, of the internet to the types of business connections between companies to people's contact patterns in society involving sexual connections per year or what have you. Um, it turns out you see these same patterns. Software engineering, the, the networks we see among components in large-scale software code bases. Many of them exhibit, you know, for now. And there's a characteristic dynamics that comes from that. There are these hubs that tend to be connected very widely with other hubs that that have massive influence, but most people are comparatively small influence. A few billionaires, super well connected to each other and can disproportionately impact by throwing money around, having lotteries to give away a million dollars per day for voter. Oh, okay, I won't get into this. Um, it, it can swing an election, right? just dumping $70 million like that into advertising campaign. And the point is, it's it's the adverse form of the golden rule all too often, unless you regulate this well. Those who have the gold make the rules. This is the danger so with scale-free networks. And they're built up. They have this common structure. We see it all around it, the same structure. And it's built up. In many cases, as a generative process, by a certain process over time, iterating gives it, and it's called preferential attachment. That things are more likely to go to something that already has lots of them. If I have a site and it has lots of things that refer to it already, any new site that comes online is a lot more likely to refer to my site than, than to others. Um, and so there's this phenomenon of preferential attachment that very commonly gives rise to scale free networks. So networks matter. Structure determines behavior, and we see markedly different patterns of behavior for scale free networks compared to a ring lattice network, compared to a scale free network, excuse me, a small world network, compared to a local a, a very localized 2D network compared to a plus on random where everyone is connected. Person A, person B are connected with equal probability, no matter who they are. Markedly, dramatically different dynamics induced in them, whether it's spread of innovation, spread of pathogen, spread of misinformation, et cetera. And I'll be asking you to review some videos um, associated with that. One on skill free networks and one on those types. And, and then assignment two for those pursuing it, there'll be an exercise going through different network types and seeing the induced study. Okay. Okay. That's all for today. Um, next week, we are, we have a uh, uh, reading, reading week. Um, and uh, I will be out of town by some family business. I, I need to uh, be my mother for some family business. Um, but I will uh, be back also next week. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you after the break. I really, I know a lot of you folks have gone through midterm exams and so on. And I hope you guys a good break and the rest. And I'll look forward to seeing you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.